Good morning, my dear fellow believers in Goulburn. It's great to see you. And what a funny way again to be talking to you. Let's get straight into our message. We have been looking for some time now at 2 Peter and we find ourselves in chapter 3 and we are nearing the end of this epistle by Peter. It's been a wonderful journey. It's a tremendously important book and something we all need to know and study and be familiar with. I am going to save one more sermon for next week. Hopefully I can see you face to face and that will be majoring on verse 18 of chapter 3 which will be growing in grace and in the knowledge of our Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. That deserves a sermon just in itself. But let's remind ourselves what we've been going through. Firstly, Peter reminds his believers that they are fully resourced. They have all the resources required to live a life of godliness and knowledge through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. So, and he says, because we are fully resourced, we must add to our faith on our behalf the virtues of the faith, which is knowledge, temperance, patience, godliness, brotherly kindness, and love. And he says, if these things are in you and they abound, they make that you won't be an unfruitful Christian. You will be a Christian that's a shining light for the Lord and Saviour Jesus Christ. Now, he that lacks those things is blind and cannot see afar off, and he's actually forgotten that he was purged from his own sins. So that's actually talking about a believer, and Peter's saying it, it is possible to be a believer but living a completely unfulfilled life because you've, you, you just, you basically you have a lack of knowledge of what God has done for you and you've forgotten that you were purged from your old sins. That's why it's important, A, that we meet together, uh, B, we partake of communion, we constantly remind ourselves of uh, what Christ has done for us. And then he reminds the believers that they have a resource, uh, the Word of God, that is sure. We have a more sure word of prophecy unto which you do well, that you take heed as unto a light that shines in a dark place. So in this dark world, we have the Bible. We hold the Bible up to the world and we say, this is light. The world is darkness. We shine the light into the world of darkness. And he gives his readers and us by extension to be confident that in, when we have the scriptures in our hands, we have the sure true word of the living God. We're so blessed to have that. Warning then in chapter 2 is that false teachers will seek to undermine the uh, biblical teaching in the scriptures. And these false teachers have certain characteristics as we saw when we went through chapter 2. Chiefly, uh, they deny the Lord that bought them. They uh, seek to make merchandise of the church. They have eyes full of adultery and they cannot cease from sin. They are wells without water, clouds that are carried in a tempest. And their destruction, because of what they do to the church, is assured. And he closes his epistle and he closes his last world words to the church and to us by extension as well, by saying, I want to stir up your pure minds by way of remembrance. So straight away, we realise that Peter is addressing our minds. And we've spoken of this before. Christianity is a, a system of belief that appeals to the mind. There's certain things that we read, we hear, and we decide in our mind that these are true. And then we act on the truth of the scriptural scriptural mandates that we're given. He says, I want to stir up your mind. In other words, continually remind you of the words which were spoken before by the holy prophets and us, the apostles. So they had the authority, they wrote it down, we read it, we know it, 
We, we pay attention to it, we mull over it, and then we act on it. And he says that in the last days, long after he will be gone, um, the last days will be characterised by people who will seek to undermine the scriptural doctrines, particularly of the second coming of Jesus Christ. And as I look at you right now, we know that we live in quite strange times for many of us that are uh, quite bizarre really, where there's so much anxiety and uncertainty around in, in the secular world because of a thing that is so small but so powerful, a virus. And Peter says, scoffers are going to come, and the, but he's saying there, there is going to be an end to the world. Won't be by the virus. So, of all people, we shouldn't be anxious. There will be, there, there is an ending, but scoffers are going to come and just say things like, all things continue as they were from the beginning of creation. Um, things just go on and on and on and you live and you die and that's it. Uh, uniformitarianism. Peter says, no, my last words to you are these, there is going to be an end. And if you don't think God intervenes in history, I tell you, Peter says, that God does intervene in history. He intervened cataclysmically in two events that you should really know about. Number one, he intervened by creating the universe and he intervened in the flood. He destroyed the world that then was uh, by a flood. Now, scoffers will come all through the last days and say, look, he hasn't come, he never will come, just go and do what you like, live your life. Like so many people this morning, as this would be, you're hearing this Sunday morning in Goulburn, just getting up, going about their lives with no thought of God, no thought of the future, no thought of uh, accountability to God at all. So scoffers for some time have done a great job on undermining the Christian faith, particularly documentaries on television with David Attenborough and all these evolutionary sort of propaganda. It's actually anaesthetized people to the reality that God will intervene in history. And Peter says they are willingly ignorant of these sins. They don't want to know the truth. And Peter says the heavens and the earth which are now, in other words, the time in which we are living, are just being kept in store, waiting for the day of judgment and the perdition of ungodly men. So everybody is hurtling towards a day of judgment with the living God. The only people who are exempt are believers who have already be, been judged when Christ died on the cross. Their sins have been paid for and judged and uh, we're considered righteous in the eyes of God. Now that's something to absolutely rejoice over, particularly in a time when uh, people's lives are falling apart. Beloved, he says in verse 8, be not ignorant. In other words, in verse 1, he says, I want to stir up your mind. I want you to remember these things. Uh, that's very positive. And in verse 8, he says, I don't negative, he turns to the negative and says, I don't want you to be ignorant. In other words, I want you to know uh, this one thing, that one day is with the Lord as a thousand years. Don't please put God in the same time slot as um, uh, human beings. He doesn't consider a day as we consider a day. God is outside of time, therefore a thousand years is nothing to God. It's just like, a th just like one day. So whenever he comes, he will come, it says, as a thief in the night. And, but the Lord is not slack concerning his promise. And his promise is that he will come again and he will judge the world in righteousness uh, because they believe not on him. So that is going to happen. It will happen. He's not slack. When, when God promises something, he's not slack concerning it. But the only reason it hasn't happened is because he's not willing that any should perish. And so the whole world waits until the elective God are, are called, justified, and one day the last member of that holy group, the Bride of Christ, uh, 
will be converted and that will be it. And he says in verse 10, that will be the day of the Lord. Now when he says the day of the Lord, he's not talking about one single day. He says it in the sense that uh, we would say, oh, back in my father's day. So, or back in, oh, back in those days. Or not in my day you won't. So he's saying it in that, you know, that sense of the word day. It's a period of time. The day of the Lord is that period of time in which God moves in judgment towards the ungodly and we know what that looks like from chapters in Revelation. So I'm not going to talk about that now. Okay, the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night. So when people least expect it, Jesus Christ will return in judgment by, uh, to avenge the saints, punish evildoers and set up the new heavens and the new earth. All right. When he does come, the heavens shall pass away with a great noise. The elements shall melt with fervent heat. The earth also and the works that are in it shall be burnt up. So he's setting it in, what he's saying, oh, I don't want you to be ignorant of that. I want you actually to know about this. The Bible speaks, I told you, maybe a quarter of the Bible is about the second coming of Christ and the events related to that. He wants us to know he says, this is what's going to happen. A great noise, elements shall melt, fervent heat. So not water this time, but heat. So the world won't be ending by global warming. It won't be ending by uh, superpowers pushing nuclear buttons. It will end by Jesus Christ. He who, who, he who created the world will be the one who dissolves the world with fervent heat. Verse 11, now, this has to affect our personal behaviour. We know these things, we are not ignorant of these things, therefore, seeing as though we know, that word again, straight to the mind, seeing as though we know these things shall be dissolved, what, that, that has to affect our lives, it must affect our lives as Christians. So whilst all the people around us are so anxious, uh, wondering when, when we'll get out of lockdown or what will happen after that, we of all people should be so stable and such a shining light for the certainty of what is actually going to happen when Jesus Christ comes. This is a time for us really to shine. So seeing as though these things shall all be dissolved, what manner of persons ought we to be in holy living and godliness so our exterior behavior of holy living should be faultless before uh, the watching world they look at us all the time and now's the time for us uh, not to join the anxious crowd but to be confident and secure in our faith um, our, our outward life and our godliness our godliness is an inner attitude that we have towards God, how we, we revere God, we honour God in our hearts. And that will show to the watching world. And it's important to God and it's important to us and it's important for the world to see that. Holy living, and which is separate living and godliness. We're in this world, we're caught up in all of this, but we are not a part of it. So, not only that, we, verse 12, should be looking for and hasting. We want this to happen, the coming of the day of the Lord, the day of God. Oh, subtle difference. The day of the Lord, judgment, verse 10, judgment on unbelievers. The day of God, slightly different. The day of God is something that we look forward to and we, we wish it would hasten and come quickly. The day of God is at the end of, of God's uh, day of the Lord, judgment of unbelievers, and that is the day when God ushers in the new heavens and the new earth. He says, the day of God where what we look forward to is the day of God where the heavens being on fire shall be dissolved and the elements shall melt with fervent heat. So God just simply dissolves everything God does it, 
He who created history is the one who dissolves history. He who created this planet is the one who dissolves this planet. Human beings do not have control over that. God does. Verse 13 says, Nevertheless, we, according to his promise, his promises, look for new heavens and a new earth in which dwelleth righteousness. What is the characteristic of the new heavens and the new earth? There is 100% righteousness. God is vindicated. God's righteous character is 100% fully on display in the new heavens and the new earth which he creates, in which dwelleth righteousness. So all that sin that has plagued this history of this planet is no longer. All that lack of peace, all that lack of harmony, it's all gone and it's all been replaced by pure, unmitigated righteousness from God. Verse 14, wherefore, wherefore, in other words, you know all this, you're not ignorant of it. Therefore, wherefore, or so, beloved believers, seeing that you look for such things, you're looking for these things. Be diligent. Diligent means you, you work at it. This is your part of your sanctification. It's my part for my sanctification. I must never lose sight of the fact that I am a born-again believe, born believer in the Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, this world does not hold a huge attraction to me. I'm here for one reason, one reason only, to bring glory and honour to the Lord Jesus Christ. So be diligent that you don't get too attached to this world. It's such a shame to see Christians uh, whinging and moaning over such little things, particularly materialism. We don't need to amass large fortunes. We don't need to amass uh, massive property and land land holdings. Why? What's the sense in that? It's all going to dissolve in fervent heat and the elements shall melt away. What's the point? There is no point. What is the point is that we should be diligent that when the Lord comes to meet us face to face, we may be found of him in peace. Yes, that could mean peace with God, peace with man, but I think it just means peace of heart. Peace of heart because you are secure in your faith. Your faith is so secure in the Lord Jesus Christ that you have peace of heart. Anything can be going on around you. I've always said, when you read the Bible carefully, you fit a person to meet any environment. We're going through an environment at the moment that people are most uncomfortable in. What, what's a Christian's default position? Thank you, God. I count it all joy, God. That's the default position of a Christian. How can I glorify you, O oh God? Why? Because we are at peace through the blood of the cross so we're at peace he wants us to be diligent diligent we need to work at the fact that we should be without spot and blameless in peace without spot and blameless in peace without spot and blameless Holy living, godliness, in peace, without spot, blameless. Without spot means we don't have these. You see, God's a God watches us 24-7. We should know that he sees every single thing, every single thought, every single thing that we behave of, and he wants us to be without spot. He wants us pure. 
He wants the world to see our purity. He wants to see God through us. So without spot and blameless. So many Christians have so much to be, sadly, ashamed of because of behaviours that they've, and sins they've committed that before a watching world. And the world looks on and says, hypocrites, I don't want um, any part of the Christian faith because of the testimony of Christians. No, 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 no. That should not be said of us. He wants us to be in peace, without spot and blameless. It's very important, our testimony before the watching world. What is our testimony? In peace, they shouldn't see anxious anxiety on us. They shouldn't see a double standard in our speech, a double standard in our living. They shouldn't see, they should look at us and say, yeah, I can't stand Christianity, but I can't find any fault with that man, such as, or woman, such as their integrity and honesty. And in our minds, we should, verse 15, account that the long suffering of our Lord is patience, even as our beloved brother Paul. So Peter says, he brings in Paul, who he knew very well, and he says, Paul has written about this. I'm writing about it, the second coming of Christ. We know that Paul wrote about it, looking for that uh, blessed hope, the glorious appearing of our Lord and Saviour, Jesus Christ, who shall change our vile bodies and make them fashioned unto like his glorious body. Paul wrote so much about this, looking for that blessed hope. Peter says, I've written about it. Paul's written about it. Paul wrote about it according to the wisdom that was given unto him. In all his epistles, some of the things are a little bit hard to be understood, in which they that are unlearned and unstable rest as they do the other scriptures unto their own destruction. There will always be people who will deliberately misquote, twist the scripture, try and deny the second coming of Christ, try and deny that it's a literal second coming. Um, but Christianity, unfortunately, is plagued with a lot of that. You, therefore, beloved, seeing you know these things before, beware, lest you also, being led away with the error of the wicked, fall from your own steadfastness. Peter's saying, I want you to be so steadfast, so true, so solid, so at peace, without spot, blameless, and in an attitude of godliness. The second coming of the Lord Jesus Christ must affect you. It must show in your lifestyle. You're not tied to this world, you're tied to the next world. And then and only then will we give glory and honour and praise to the Lord Jesus Christ and his great doctrine of the second coming of Jesus.